three delicious Indian vegetarian dishes to enjoy with roti. Indian cabbage and potato curry cooked my way with ice. It's as basic as it is beautiful. Let's start by shredding our cabbage. I'm using a mandolin, but you can use a knife and use any white or green cabbage you like. Next, peel some potatoes, any floury variety will do, and chop them into one centimeter cubes. This is a wonderful homestyle Indian curry recipe, which pairs perfectly with wholemeal rutli. You can have it on the table in under 30 minutes. Since it takes no time at all to prepare, you can chop these potatoes and leave them aside until needed. However, if you're preparing the potatoes in advance, then I recommend you soak them in some cold water to prevent them from turning brown. Now that our potatoes are ready, it's time to temper some spices in hot oil, which is going to allow these spices to slowly release their aromas. In we go with some mustard seeds and cumin seeds. They will crackle, asafoetida or hing, some minced ginger, I'm using fresh but frozen's fine too. These are canned tomatoes, you can also use fresh if you prefer and they don't have to be super smooth. Ground turmeric for a lovely colour. Chilli powder, as much or as little as you like. Salt and a small amount of sugar just to balance the acidity of the tomatoes. Now give everything a good stir and allow it to come to a gentle simmer. We're going to cook this uncovered until the oil begins to separate from the tomatoes. Just like this. Once we get to this point, we can add in our prepared potatoes and cabbage. Stir to coat all of the veggies in that delicious tomato masala. Since this is a dry style stir fried curry, we're going to cook it with an ice lid. The technique is based on an age old cooking method where the cook would fit a pot with a lipped lid or plate and fill it with cold water. Science. The juices from the vegetables rise up, condense and fall back down, cooking everything perfectly. This forgoes the need to add any water to the food and therefore preserves all the natural flavours of the ingredients. The traditional method calls for the plate to be filled with cold water, but we're going a step further to build more steam by using ice. Cook this over a low heat, stirring at the five minute mark. The ice will melt and you will be rewarded with the most meltingly tender cabbage and potatoes, all cooked in their own vegetable juices. If you don't want to try this method, you can of course cook this curry with the traditional lid. However, I find that this technique really does help when the veggies require a little bit of cooking, but you still want to give the dish a dry stir-fry-like finish. The low and slow heat underneath encourages the cabbage to release all of its moisture, cooking the potatoes at the same time. The final step is to give this a final stir fry over a high heat, stirring all the time. Some of the cabbage and potatoes might brown a little, that's just going to add lots of extra flavour. This final step will allow any excess moisture to quickly evaporate off and you will be left with the most delicious home-style Indian curry to scoop up with buttery chapati. I like mine spicy, so I finish off with some chopped green chilies and a burst of fresh coriander. Final stir and it's time to plate up. I'd love to know what some of your favourite homestyle Indian dishes are and maybe I can recreate them. Leave me a comment below and if you haven't subscribed to my channel already, then please do. I love having you here. Next, let me show you another favourite Indian vegetarian dish. This is a simple weeknight masala paneer. I love cooking with the Indian cheese paneer and this is one of my favourite ways to use it. The first thing we need to do is pan fry our paneer for a beautiful golden crust. 
I'm doing this in key, but you could also use oil. Sauteing the paneer not only gives it a great color, it also adds some beautiful texture to the dish. Take some care while you're doing this because the paneer does have a tendency to hiss and spit. Now the paneer is golden, we can continue with prepping our spices. For bags of flavour, I like to strip curry leaves from the stem and chop them up really finely. If you prefer, you can add your curry leaves in whole. To slice, simply bundle them up just like this and then chop with a sharp knife into fine shreds. Keep the remaining key in the pan, there's no need to wash it, just add in some cumin seeds, coarsely ground black pepper, ginger and garlic, some slipped green chilies, as many or as few as you like, the curry leaves, and some freshly chopped coriander leaves and stems. Now in with a chopped onion, A sprinkle of asafoetida, which I forgot to add earlier, and give it all a really good mix. And we want to cook this over a medium heat for around four to five minutes, just until the onions start to turn golden. Keep moving it around all the time because we don't want any of these ingredients to burn. You can speed up the process of browning the onions by adding a pinch of salt. Next we go in with a chopped tomato and continue to stir and cook for a further four to five minutes. Once it gets to a soft and kind of mushy stage, we want to add our dry spices. First up, some turmeric and garam masala. I'm using a homemade blend, but you can also use shop bought. Stir and cook this for another couple of minutes. Move it all the time because dry spices do have a tendency to burn quickly. If you find it is burning, then you can either turn the heat down or add in a tiny splash of water. Our masala is now ready and it's time to add in that fried paneer. A little sprinkle of some fresh coriander just to freshen it up. Now stir to coat the paneer in that spicy masala and heat everything through. This is a great recipe to make during busy weeknights because it takes very little time and if you're not making masala dosa, you can also enjoy this paneer curry with roti, naan or paratha. It's bold, bright, spicy and full of flavour. You can also make this paneer masala well ahead of time and store it in the fridge for later. That makes it the perfect vegetarian option for meal prep and batch cooking. Once the paneer has heated through, all of those soft cheese chunks will become super squidgy. It's time to eat. Our last homestyle Indian curry is mung bean curry, also known as mung masala. This creamy mung bean curry or mung masala is a wholesome Indian vegetarian dish to enjoy with roti. It's super thick and cooked with an aromatic paste of ginger, green chili and coriander. The star of the show is a tarka of crispy fried garlic which goes on right at the end. To make this dish we first need to wash and soak the mung beans. An essential step when preparing any type of lentils, beans or pulses is to wash them thoroughly and soak them. Washing removes any surface dirt and soaking softens the beans to make them more digestible. It's a good idea to change out the water a couple of times, topping up with fresh water and continuing to clean until the water runs fairly clear. I'm choosing to use the hot soak method for my beans and this is the one that I go to more often and it simply refers to soaking the beans in hot water with a pinch of baking soda, also known as bicarbonate of soda, added to it. Now 
The combination of hot water and baking soda creates the perfect soaking conditions. It encourages the beans to soften quickly and cook quickly later. For this recipe, if you can't get your hands on mung beans, then it is entirely possible to make it with green lentils, also called green masoor or moth beans. Soak the beans for 30 minutes. The basis for this mung bean curry is a hot and aromatic green chilli paste. I like to pound Indian green chilies, also known as jwala chilies, garlic, ginger and juicy coriander stems in a pestle and mortar. They bruise to a coarse pulp and that's all you really need for this. If you like you can use a blender or a grinder, but my inner Indian grandma tells me it tastes so much better when you bash it by hand. Heat some ghee in a pan and then add in some cumin seeds. Some asafoetida, also known as hing, and this also needs to be sizzled in the hot key. Next up, we're going to throw in our green aromatic paste and cook that out for a couple of minutes over a medium-ish heat. Mung beans and any lentils in general are a fantastic blank canvas for any kinds of flavours that you might want to cook them with. Next up, we will add a chopped fresh tomato for a zip of tang. You can also use tinned tomatoes if you don't have fresh or even a squidge of tomato paste. It's important to cook this out for a couple of minutes just until the tomatoes start to thicken up a little bit. Once the tomatoes get to this stage, drain your mung beans and add them in. Since they've had their nice hot water soak, they're not going to take too much time to cook. The baking soda water has softened the skins really beautifully. Give this a really good stir and then top it up with some boiling hot water. I've heard stories of my grandmother inspecting everybody's bean and lentil dishes to ensure that they never add cold water to their dish and rather top it up with boiling hot water. She used to say Tudra Tejai, which in Gujarati means that they will turn into hard pellets. Bring this to a boil, cover with a tight fitting lid and simmer for around 30 to 40 minutes until the beans have softened. You'll be able to find a link to the full recipe with all of the ingredients and measurements you'll need in the description box below. Once the beans are lovely and soft, we are going to add in some ground spices. I have here some cinnamon, turmeric, and some salt. And it's important to add the salt after the beans have cooked, not before. Finally, some kasuri methi, and then begin to beat this with a balloon whisk until it's thick and creamy. Beating, break some of the beans down, encourage some of the starches to come out, and then the whole thing becomes really luxurious and velvety. And the point here is not to break the beans down entirely. We do want some fabulous texture in there, but we also want the curry to be nice and cohesive, and more like a curry than a dal. You'll notice I added in a little bit of hot water to adjust the consistency here and you'll find that the dal begins to thicken a lot more as it stands. It's basically like a sponge, so be sure to adjust the consistency with water and if you would like this to be a dal, then just add some more water. This is exactly how I like mine. It still has that coarse beanie texture but is perfectly scoopable for roti. Now that the mung beans are cooked, we're going to add the final touch to this dish, which is a very lovely garlic darka. Slice your cloves of garlic into very fine, wafer-thin pieces, so thin that you can practically see through them. Once they're ready, heat some ghee in a small pan and allow it to become smoking hot. a small pinch of cumin seeds. Turn the heat down and then add in the garlic. Garlic and mung beans really are the best of friends and this dish is one of the most delicious ways to cement their union. 
With the heat turned down to low, continue to stir this, moving the garlic around all the time to ensure that it browns evenly. We want it to be a very pale golden colour, not too dark at all because once we take it off the heat, it's going to continue to cook and the garlic will darken and we don't want it to turn bitter. If you're worried about it cooking too quickly, you can always switch the heat off and allow the dharka and the garlic to cook in the residual heat. This is almost ready and I cannot wait to pour this all over that creamy moon curry that we made. It smells incredible. I wish you could smell it through your screen. Unfortunately, you can't, so you're just gonna have to take my word for it. Some fresh coriander leaves just for color and freshness. And that's it. We are ready to pour our aromatic garlic and ghee darka all over our creamy, delicious moong curry. Are you ready? Let's do it. Scoop this up with your favorite Indian breads. I like mine with roti, but you can also enjoy it with burrata or naan. Full link to the recipe is in the description box below. And if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, I would love for you to do that. Please hit that subscribe button and I will see you next time with a new recipe.